That's Acts 21, starting at verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut, and they were seeking to kill him. Word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them, I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed journeyed towards Damascus to take those also who were there and to bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, About noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one, Ananias, a devout man according to the Lord, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, 
and to hear a voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that I in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the, to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. Now, last weekend, I sat on a train next to a friendly man, and I would say we exchanged warmer pleasantries than I normally do on a train anyway. And as he got off, he said to me, when did we start celebrating Halloween in this country? It never really used to be a thing, did it? Um, I think it was a genuine question, and I replied with one word, Americanization, Americanization. And he nodded his head, and he said, ah, yes, Americanization. We're just America's lapdog, aren't we? Now, it wasn't quite what I was saying, um, but it was a touching moment nonetheless to get a sort of approval uh, from a stranger. But another thing we may have picked up from the United States, uh, along with Halloween, is the concept of a confirmation hearing. Um, we might read about them on the news when they're confirming a new Supreme Court justice. We might have seen them on Amazon Prime's Jack Ryan where they're confirming a new director of the CIA. A confirmation hearing is basically a funny sort of trial where a proposed candidate for a certain position is asked, based on their record, to defend their appointment. And this evening in Acts, we're um, attending the confirmation trial for Christianity, Christianity represented by the Apostle Paul. It is the first of four hearings confirming his work. And it is an unusual trial. It initially takes place on the steps of the temple in Jerusalem in front of a mob. And it finishes off in the more conventional setting before the rulers of the, nation's, of the nation. And just to be clear for the rest of our time, every time we refer to Jerusalem or its inhabitants, we're referring to first century Jerusalem. And we're making no comment on contemporary issues at all. And Paul is on trial for his historical and theological credibility. Does he actually represent the true work of God in the world? Now, in recent times, I've kept this on the down low, but I'm a fan of Chelsea Football Club. And 20 years ago, when Roman Abramovich bought the club, our prospects took a radical turn for the better. And largely due to his investment, and we won back-to-back -back Premier Leagues in 2005-2006, but Liverpool fans did not like our rapid turn to success. And they came up with an ingenious chant. And blank, blank, Chelsea FC, you ain't got no history. But you ain't got no history is the sort of chant that might have been levelled at Paul in first century Jerusalem. And why does that matter to us? Well, if we don't have confidence in Paul, um, we might as well not be a Christian. I mean... Why have we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? We didn't hear it from Jesus, did we? Apart from a brief trip to Egypt as an infant, Jesus never really went further than his county town. He never needed a passport in his adult life. He was the king of the Jews, the savior of Israel. But the message about him came to us through his apostles, chiefly represented by Paul here. Christianity only matters if it's true. And therefore, uh, it really matters if the apostles represent the genuine work of God in the world. And Luke doesn't want us to just think that the apostles are probably or sort of or kind of right, or just that they were historically there uh, around the time of Jesus and knew Jesus. But Luke wants us to have supreme confidence that Paul did, uh, um, that in what Paul did, 
and the legacy he left is in fact what God did and what God is doing in the world today. Again, if we don't have confidence in Paul, we have no confidence in how we received the gospel. In the first century, Paul was said to be representing some outlandish sect, uh, which was leading a people away from the historic worship of God, which for a thousand years had been centered on Jerusalem. Jerusalem was historically the Lord's city with the Lord's temple, where the Lord himself was said to return to one day. But Paul had been operating on the outer rim of importance in the historical biblical world. Why should Jerusalem care about the apostle to Tatooine or wherever he'd been? Blank, blank, Paul, they might chant. You ain't got no history. But Paul is going to demonstrate that nothing could be further from the truth, not by his own merits, but by the command of the risen Lord Jesus. And he has, Paul that is, fulfilled the plans and purposes of God. He is a special servant of God, completing the work of God. That's what he's been doing in the first 20 chapters of Acts so far. And this confirmation trial is here so we can have what we need to have, supreme confidence in his work, that Paul's way is indeed God's way. And the first thing we see is that Paul is confirmed in his suffering service, that Paul is the suffering servant. And we didn't read it, but as we come to chapter 21, and we see that Paul is on his final leg of his farewell tour around his work in the ancient Near East. And he arrives in Jerusalem with a delegation representing all the apostles' work in Acts. So as we come to see Paul on trial, it's not merely Paul in a personal capacity. It is actually the work of the risen Lord Jesus on trial through his servant, Paul. All Jesus has ultimately done by his spirit through his word in Acts establishing a worldwide kingdom at this point. But Paul doesn't just represent Jesus, but he resembles him. Just like Jesus' trial on earth, you might know, there are three predictions of Paul's suffering in Acts. And Paul, like Jesus, has to convince his companions that he must suffer to fulfill the purposes of God. There's a double witness to Paul's suffering in verses 1 to 14 of chapter 21. So in verse 4, the believers through the Spirit tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And then in a more filled out way, uh, explaining the same thing, I think, in verses 10 and 11, a prophet called Agabus does a weird thing, maybe in our eyes, and takes off Paul's belt and binds his own feet with it and says, this is how Paul will be handed over to the Gentiles, which is a fate that certainly wasn't pleasant for Jesus um, only decades before. In light of this information, verse 12, the believers were urging him not to go to Jerusalem. But then Paul spoke, and they were convinced it was the will of the Lord for him to suffer. Chapter 21, verses 13 and 14. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am, not, I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded... We ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. But why did Paul have to suffer? Um, you might know that one of the central promises of God in the Bible is that he would save the world through a suffering servant. It may sound strange, but it is in fact one of the most attractive things about Christianity. Jesus did not and does not conquer triumphalistically um, through military force. The way Jesus conquered turn the valleys of the world upside down in a truly radical way in the first century. He conquered sin and death through his own suffering and death on the cross. But the suffering of Jesus in his earthly life is actually incomplete. It is lacking. Now, before some of you go outside and chop up that white tree and try and burn me at the stake, um, hear this out. And Jesus did pay fully, finally, and satisfactorily for the sins of the whole world on the cross. If we trust in the Lord Jesus for forgiveness, we can be 100% sure that he pays the penalty we deserve for our sin. Jesus' suffering service is complete in that sense. But it's not complete because in Jesus' earthly service, that salvation never reached the world. 
And that's where Paul comes in. He completes the work of the suffering servant by establishing Jesus' message of salvation works in every nation to the ends of the earth. And we can be confident and that Paul's work is genuine because it's just like Jesus' earthly work. It has the Lord's fingerprints all over it. It's his MO. The word of God did not conquer triumphalistically, but through suffering. And if you've been here, if we looked through Acts in the last few months and even over the last few years, that's what we've seen, isn't it? Paul has been beaten and stoned and abused. Believers has been persecuted and pressured. But it is in exactly this way that the word has spread and Jesus' kingdom has advanced and conquered the world. And Paul knows just as his service um, of Jesus in his travels involves suffering, that pattern will be confirmed in his trials to come as well. The suffering servant. But lucky for us, not only was Paul's suffering confirmed, but the success of his service is confirmed as well. Paul is the successful servant. And we see that Paul is confirmed by the risen Lord Jesus in succeeding to do what the ancient Jerusalem never did. In chapter, 20, in chapter 21, verses 17 to 26, Paul and his representative delegation and first visit the believers in Jerusalem. Now, some of the believers, they're nervous that the chance of Paul about Paul might be true, that he hasn't got any history. They've been told that Paul had forsaken Moses. Now, of course, Paul could have been totally outraged at this point and explained why that accusation is nonsense. But he humbly accepted the suggestion to demonstrate his respect for the mosaic, his, his mosaic inheritance. Now, some of this stuff might sound a bit archaic to some of us, but it really matters because all the claims that Jesus makes are based on what God says in the Old Testament. If you've ever been nervous that the gospel of Jesus doesn't fit in with the weird, in our eyes, rites and ceremonies of the Old Testament, this is important to get our heads around. Because if we're not confident that Paul is the true heir of the Old Testament witness, then we can't be confident in what Paul says about Jesus. Now, in this setting, we need to um, be capable of nuance here, which is difficult, or I, I find difficult, in our social media generation. But Paul lived in a transitional age in regards to the temple. Jesus had already pronounced judgment on the temple in Luke chapter 21. He said that the days will come when there will be not left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. A statement that's hard to believe, even if you visit um, the temple, I guess you can't right now, but even if you visited the temple or can in the future, just the base layer of stones to the left are way taller than I am. And the idea that this magnificent structure would come down um, was hard to believe. But Jesus made clear that it would. And Jesus himself said that he now is the true temple of God, fulfilling everything that it symbolized. And if you're here this evening and you're not following um, the Lord Jesus, um, but you want to encounter the glory of God here today, um, Jesus says you now come to him, not the temple. And Jesus says you come to him by listening to the words of his apostles. The time of the physical temple's spiritual significance was over. But when Paul came into Jerusalem, uh, the temple still physically stood. And this is a transitional age because Paul knows it's only a matter of time before the temple is going to be destroyed. Yet even given that, it's interesting, isn't it, that he still shows a nuanced respect for the practices which were instituted by God. Why does he do that? Well, he's demonstrating he stands in line with God's revelation and is not opposed to it. He perfectly fits as the sort of last leg of the relay um, in the servants of God from Moses. But while he's trying to show he stands in line with the Old Testament, um, multiple massive ironies um, strike in the temple. Um, Jews who had come from Asia um, to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Pentecost, they recognize Paul and they stir up a crowd against him. Um, verse 28, they cry out, men of Israel, help. 
This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he's even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they have previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. This is ironic in the first instance because um, Paul is innocent of their specific charge. He would not brought a Gentile into the physical temple, which they were concerned about. It was actually at the end of nearly completing a temple purification rite. But what's much more ironic, and here's the big thing in Acts, Paul has in fact brought Gentiles into the temple, into the true temple of Jesus Christ. Many thousands of them. And looking back from our perspective, and blazing a trail for billions of people to come. People all over the world who have encountered the living God in the person of Jesus Christ through his apostolic word preached by Paul. Paul had exceeded, uh, succeeded in achieving what ancient earthly Jerusalem temple um, never did in bringing light to the whole world. And in, um, in fact, in one sense here, Paul had brought the temple to the world by sharing Jesus' gospel word. But the Jews from Asia had actually brought the world to the temple. If you're here a few weeks ago, just like the pagans in Ephesus, they stirred up a near identical riot. So we, we heard that they brought violence, that the whole city was in confusion, with people shouting one thing and some another. And just like a few decades earlier, uh, with another man in Jerusalem who is doing the will of God, they want to kill Paul. And when the soldiers intervene, they shout the same thing they shouted at Jesus, away with him, wanting to see him executed by the Roman authorities. But again, Paul is nothing like them. He is not a violent revolutionary leading a revolt like the Roman tribune misidentifies him as. He's not some wannabe Spartacus or something. In fact, in the Lord's design, he is the perfect person for the service he's been asked to do. He spoke good Greek, the tribune noticed, the universal language of the day. Yes, he was brought up in Jerusalem, and in his defense, he lays out an Israelite CV, which is basically to die for. But he was also a citizen of the world, of the cosmopolitan city of Tarsus, Later, we're reminded he's also a Roman citizen. There is no one better placed to take the truth about the saving God of Israel and to proclaim him to the world. And again, ironically, given the accusation of defiling the temple, in chapter 22, and Paul says, while he's praying in the temple, the Lord spoke to him. And in chapter 22, verse 21, the Lord said to him, go, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. What they're condemning Paul for doing in the temple is actually what the Lord himself commanded Paul to do in the temple. And amazingly in Paul's defense speech so far, he's kept the attention of the crowd up until this point. His credentials seem to have given him a hearing. And perhaps the crowd might be beginning to think, maybe this guy could be some sort of national prophet or teacher or something. But tensions suddenly rise again. And Luke highlights it simply because of that phrase. Um, Maybe they're even triggered by that word, Gentiles. Verse 22, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. At this point, Paul shows himself to be the successful servant of the Lord. His work commissioned by the Lord was in fact fulfilling the law. God had always said he was going to bless the world through his servant. The ancient nation of Israel had failed as servants because of their unfaithfulness to the Lord. But Paul, the servant of the risen Lord Jesus, had succeeded where they had failed, bringing light to the world, confirming that he indeed represents the true work of God in the world. And at the same time as Paul's conclusively theologically confirmed, Jerusalem is conclusively theologically condemned. Paul has brought light to the world, but first century Israel has brought darkness to the temple. Their rejection of God's servant Paul 
follows in the footsteps of their rejection of Jesus. And if you remember back a few weeks, the idolatry of the Ephesian metal workers was threatened by the transformation the gospel brings for all people. They were losing their money as people turned to Jesus. And the now idolatry of Jerusalem was threatened in a similar way. They wanted to cling on to a special privilege that empowered them over others. They were clinging on to a picture of God's work in the temple when the privilege of knowing God and the power to bring people to know him is being represented by Paul. Paul's way is conclusively and climactically confirmed to be the true way of the Lord and the temple. But there's still confusion. Um, why, what is really at the heart of this trial? Yes, Paul is on trial. His new way is on trial. But what has put Jerusalem on a different course to Paul when they claim to be singing from the same Old Testament hymn sheet? That's what the Roman tribune wants to know as well in chapter 22, verse 30. In the rates, on the next day, desiring to know the real reason he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down to set him before them. And at this final stage of his first defense, um, we get conclusively confirmed by Paul, slightly different to advertised, if you follow your handout, that Paul is the revolutionary servant. He is the revolutionary servant. And we're going to see the fact that Paul is a revolutionary insofar as he serves Jesus' revolution. And in this final part of his Jerusalem trial, he shows himself to be very shrewd as well. He manages to extricate himself from danger while also explaining the ultimate reason he was on trial. Alastair Campbell in his prime would have been proud of this sort of maneuver, I think. Um, look down, see what you make of it with me. It's chapter 23, verse 6 to 10. Now, when Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees partly stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. Now, bringing up the resurrection from the dead was a very shrewd move because it revealed the division in the council. It ultimately led to Paul's safe removal. But it revealed much more it is a true statement. It is because of the hope and the resurrection of the dead that Paul was on trial. The hope and the resurrection of the dead speak of the same thing, which the Pharisees and all Orthodox Jews believed, that there is a day where the Lord himself would come to earth, would resurrect everyone and restore the kingdom to Israel by establishing his king in Jerusalem and would call the whole world to worship him establishing peace and justice and truth and goodness, his glory over the whole world. Israelites waiting for the resurrection were like a kid waiting for Christmas. And the Pharisees are happy to entertain the idea that Paul had something to say on the matter. But Paul stands as a witness to the fact that the hope and the resurrection has already begun and has arrived early in the person of Jesus Christ. He was crowned king in Jerusalem, not by military force, but by his death on a cross. And he was resurrected and rose to sit at the right hand of his father in the true throne room in heavenly Jerusalem. He has poured out his spirit, if you remember all the way back to Acts 2, and through his servant has called people from the ends of the earth to himself. The resurrection of Jesus is the day that God's revolution began. And again, if you're here and you're investigating um, the truth claims of the Christian faith. The resurrection is the place to start, as it from there everything else unravels. And Paul has proven in Jerusalem that he is a servant of that revolution, a revolution begun by God, and which is um, what the law of Moses always pointed.
towards. Just finally, notice who comes as Paul's final confirmatory witness in this first trial. And the Pharisees say that maybe a spirit or an angel spoke to him. Well, it's even more impressive than that, isn't it? And it is the risen Lord of the resurrection himself who spoke to Paul. Paul's already recounted him speaking on his journey to Damascus. He'd already counted him speaking when he was commissioned in the temple. And now the risen Lord confirms Paul's revolutionary service. Verse 11 there. And the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. There's no greater confirmation than that. The Apostle Paul has shown that he is the suffering servant. In proclaiming the gospel to the ends of the earth, he fills up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions in his earthly ministry. He is a successful servant, bringing light to the world, fulfilling the hopes of Old Testament Israel in a way they could have never imagined. And he's a revolutionary servant, confirmed by the risen Lord Jesus himself as the official spokesperson of his resurrection resolution. More on that next week. You ain't got no history, Jerusalem says to Paul. But Paul shows that's categorically not the case. The Christianity that Paul represents is the fulfillment of all of God's work in the past and the faithful work of God today. And the believers in Cambodia we heard about earlier and believers amongst us here, we can be assured that if we've responded to Paul's apostolic word about Jesus, we're included in his historic kingdom. Or as Joel goes back to Cambodia and does the sort of things that Paul did, explains Jesus from the Bible, encourages and strengthens others with the word of God, is publicly willing to stand with the Lord Jesus. As she does those things, she can have supreme confidence that she is serving God in the way that Moses would, if he walked the earth today, the way that David would, the way that Paul would. It will involve some suffering now, sooner or later, if we do it faithfully. But it's a service that succeeds in bringing about the plans of God. And it's part of the resurrection revolution, which will lead to eternal life and God's glory. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you so much that through your apostolic word about the Lord Jesus, we have access to the forgiveness of sins and the hope of the final resurrection to come. Thank you that we can be confident that we're in your kingdom and that we can play a part in filling your kingdom as we serve that word, going out to those who are lost and strengthening those who are found to keep going to the end. Amen.